our next presentation proves to be an interesting one. We have a gentleman by the name of Jeff Bowles. Jeff is from DLBA, formerly Donald L. Blunt and Associates. Uh, now DLBA is a subsidiary of Gibson Cox. Um, formerly Donald Blunt and now part of Gibson Cox. I like that. DLBA is a consultant, uh, naval architecture, and marine engineering group supporting a wide range of market sectors in the marine maritime world. Jeff graduated from Webb Institute in 2000 with a degree in naval architecture and marine engineering, and then obtained a master's license in marine engineering from the University of Newcastle in 2001. He signed on with DLBA in October 2001 and has never looked back. Uh, unfortunately, Jeff didn't go into uh, design and drawing and run Disney's graphics department, but he knows a guy who did. Uh, the interesting thing when I talked to Jeff about first coming uh, to give a presentation here, uh, he called me back and he was in his car. He was on his way out to Virginia Tech, or University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, out to their tank testing facility to test some, I don't know, high tech, secret, classified, maritime, military, uh, all kinds of fancy stuff. The, the engineering that these guys are involved in is really spectacular. Give a warm welcome to Jeff, Jeff Holtz. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, thanks to uh, Paul and I, YBA, for this opportunity to get up and share a little bit of wisdom and knowledge here. Um, what's uh, a little different, I guess, about me relative to... Oh, there we go. See? It's on the screen. Come on. Come on. There we go. Um, so I'm the first guy up here I noticed that's going to talk about not hardware, right? We had engine guys, we had nautical alert, and uh, we had sea keepers. And that's all hardware. You guys can sink your teeth into it. You can understand about these products that are on boats. And, and I'm not going to do any of that. And in fact, really, I don't have any software to tell you about. So no computer programs. So I hope that just doesn't make me soft. Um, but that being said, we are going to try to talk a little bit today about refit and naval architecture. Um, when Paul and I had that conversation in the car, we talked about it. I gave him a couple of different topics, and he picked this one. I said, great, that's the hardest one to cover. Um, because how can I get into the details uh, up here in such a short time frame and know all of the different needs? So I think what I'm trying to do here is, is to really just provide a general overview, some things to think about when you might want to call a naval architect. Um, and they will help you go through that process of what makes sense for the owners and what doesn't. And what we're trying to do here is sell more boats, right? We want all of you to be more successful. Um, and how do you do that? Well, if you're selling cable or Internet, right, it's the bundle. Everybody wants a bundle. So perhaps you have the yacht, but it's not quite perfect, so maybe we'll do a refit and make it exactly what I want, and then we can help that transaction move forward. So that's the concept of um, when, when it doesn't make sense to do a refit on a boat that either help a sail or to keep the boat alive. So, um, you know, because of the number of yachts available and the current order book, what we're seeing is that a lot of people are buying and modifying it. And that does make a lot of sense, especially when there's a time constraint involved. Um, that's typically what drives it that way. It's not often cost. Um, you know, so that refit can be considered a part of the sales transaction, almost like a condition of sale. I'm only going to buy it if I can do this, and I'm only going to do that if it costs less than X. Uh, I'm sure you've all have heard those scenarios from time to time. So, so what makes sense from a refit perspective? Uh, what should you do, what you shouldn't do? Um, really, the takeaway is every project is unique, and it needs to be looked at on a case-by-case basis. Uh, you've got to make sure that the boat can handle it. You've got to make sure that the owner can handle it. There's a lot of stress involved there for him as well between uh, the money and the time, right? Um, and you've got to have the right team assembled in order to assess what the owner wants to do. I think that's the, the great key here. Um, we've been talking earlier. We've got some surveyors around, and I'm going to have a slide of those guys in a minute. Uh, obviously, there's the brokers. Uh, you might have insurance. You might have Nate from All Points uh, trying to work on um, the little bit that they're going to do to bring the boat up to snuff to correct a couple of latent defects. But at the end of the day, what you really want to do is make sure you have the full amount of team. Uh, if you want to upgrade and put in a new toy, you got to make sure Tom is there so that it can all work out. And then it's not a boat question, and I kind of quipped about this last night as I talked with a bunch of the guys uh, you know, we can turn a Broward into a nuclear aircraft carrier. We can turn a nuclear aircraft carrier into a Broward if you want to. But it doesn't necessarily always make sense to do that technically, but it's possible. So really the question becomes an owner question. What's feasible for the owner? What level of pain tolerance does the owner have? Uh, that's going to be the driving decision that helps you go forward in trying to understand if we can package this deal up with a refit and get a happy owner in the end. 
Because happy owners is what it's all about. Without those, they don't have a need for all of us or the things we do on a daily basis, and we can't lose sight of that. Um, so marine surveyor. What is a marine surveyor? I put this up here uh, to, to lead into the next slide, which was what is a naval architect. And I'm sure everyone in this room knows what a marine surveyor is. Um, you can see I've got a couple of bullet points up there. They can be for class. They can be independent. Most often tied to uh, evaluation processes for insurance or sales, you know, any type of transaction. Uh, if something happens uh, or there's a claim, you know, they'll get involved. Um, those guys are really, really smart. They see a lot of boats. They see more boats than a uh, naval architect, and they see more boats than a uh, captain. A captain will see a lot of one boat or two boats or three boats in his career, but really the surveyor uh, is on a different boat every other day kind of thing. And so they have tremendous exposure, and they can look very quickly and say, that's right or that's not right. So what's a naval architect, right? So that's what I am. And the naval architect has a little bit different position. It's our responsibility to make sure that the boat is safe uh, for the owner uh, and that the passengers are safe for the owner or operator. That's our job. And in order to do that, we have to be knowledgeable about all of the different things that go on out there. The second bullet point up here is one that I kind of like. I heard this a long time ago. I couldn't find the original source. I kind of had to make it up myself to get it on here. Um, but we do a pretty unique thing. So a guy who's a land architect builds a house. He follows code. He picks out the length of the, uh, of the size of the, 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 the roof truss based on the length. And he's got snow load, and all that stuff is put into it. Some places, if you have, you know, earthquakes, maybe there's a little bit of extra work to do. But the naval architect, you know, we we um, we work with materials we don't fully understand. Composites, right? Exactly, fiberglass. Depending on how you orient the fibers, it's going to behave differently. If something's cold or hot, it's going to behave, behave differently. Uh, loads that are difficult to estimate. We really don't know what the sea load is going to be. We have statistical stuff that says they should be about here. But if you have that freak rogue wave, one out of every hundred, that can exceed all the loads that you imagine. How do you deal with that? Uh, and then we operate in an environment that's unpredictable, right? We don't know how the operators are going to use the boat. We don't know what the environment's going to throw at us. So it's, it's a pretty weird, synthesized world that we live in as naval architects. The important part of all this is to show this thing. This is a design spiral. And as we start at the design of a vessel, we start out here and we work all the way around through the concept design to the preliminary design contract and then the details are in the middle once we get into that tight circle. The important thing is that a naval architect has formal training and it has discipline and everything in here which affects hydrostatics or which includes hydrostatics, hydrodynamics, structure, electrical engineering, HVAC, all the different things we've touched on this morning. We've got some level of knowledge of it and really because when you look at a refit, right, You've got a yacht that's expensive, it's complex, and you have a lot of stuff that's tight, uh, placed in a very tight package. And when you, when you think of the term running a tight ship in refit world, what that means is when you push in on one side of the bag, something's going to pop out on the other side of the bag. Right? So you need that big picture view to say, does this stuff make sense? What unintended consequences am I going to introduce to myself and my owner if we don't think this through all the way? So what's a refit? Maintenance. No, that's not refit. You don't need a naval architect, maybe a marine surveyor for, for maintenance if you're doing bottom paint or new bright work. Repair, okay, you know, maybe, maybe do you need to get someone involved. If the boat's where the work can be done, you don't have to transport it with temporary repairs, uh, and you just got to reinstate the original laminate uh, schedule that's a composite boat, then, then you can probably do that without much help. Um, and then, okay, now we're starting to talk about refit, right? We're lengthening things, we're adding significant pieces of equipment. Yeah, hey, that's a refit. That's not a shipyard period or a bottom job period or something that gets counted as refits from time to time. Um, and then, of course, if you're, a, if you're a class vessel, then just about everything you do is considered a refit because you have to have drawings and documentations for the surveyor in order to maintain the condition of survey as well as maintain the value of the boat in general. Um, so just a little introduction there. Uh, refit feasibility to go back around. Right? Circle back to what we're talking about here and keep me from losing focus. Um, maintenance. Is it a refit? No, not really. These types of things, you know, they're simple. Coating renewals, which could be bottom jobs. It can be top paint. Uh, you can have aesthetic upgrades. Equipment renewal or replacement with light capacity. You know, don't put an engine in it that's uh, 400 more horsepower or go from a Seakeeper 3 to a Seakeeper 30 and, and not tell anyone. Um, those types of things are, are considered uh, not maintenance, right? 
So in, in situations like this, it always makes sense. Go for it. You find a couple of defects that the marine surveyor does. You upgrade them. You move on with the project. Okay, so now we have repair. So in these times, you might get in there and the surveyor has a little bit deeper laundry list where you need to, uh, you know, the engines are worn out or um, we got to upgrade some equipment to have a little bit of additional capacity so we can carry a little bit larger tender. Um, you might want to put in a gyro in. If you're, those are hitting on, landing on engine girders, we often find through analysis that the engine girders are just fine. Um, so maybe it's refit. Maybe it's a little bit of a, uh, of a simple upgrade or a replacement of things. Uh, and in those condensing conditions, again, it always makes sense. Uh, if, that's, if those are the types of stuff that you need to do in order to facilitate a sale and make it a bundle, then by all means, go for it. Um, but now you get into real stuff. And this is the stuff where you got to have somebody involved, and you really need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure you're not getting yourselves in trouble or getting your owner into a position that he's not going to be comfortable with in the end. Um, interior systems, oops, sorry. Interior systems, entertainment systems, nav and uh, communication. Not really a naval architect thing. I put a line through it, right? It's not really me. Um, but that's a big, those can be huge, right? An interior, full interior upgrade can take months, uh, if not years. Engine upsizing or downsizing. If you say, hey, we used to have 12 V92s and we can now do it with a Cummins QSB uh, 5.9, you need to check that. You need to look at that. Perhaps the weight and center of gravity moves, right? Because we've taken out engines that weigh 8,000 pounds each, and we put in an engine that weighs 1,200 pounds, and now the center of gravity of the boat's in a different place, and they're the same horsepower, so it's still a 25-knot boat, and you get up to 25 knots, and the boat heels over to one side due to dynamic instability. You didn't think about that. And that's, again, some of the reasons where you have to look at these things that are this significant on a case-by-case -case basis. Superstructure changes can affect the way um, the boat responds to, you know, meets the stability requirements with additional windage. Tank modifications, oh, just add a new tank or take a tank out, well, maybe you know, a tank boundary out. Maybe now the free surface effect has changed. You won't meet class stability requirements anymore. Um, and major equipment additions. Anytime you put anything on the boat, whether it's a new davit, uh, a, a larger gyro or a gyro for that instance, um, you can have a lot of the toys that are out there, the slides that go up on the top deck all the way down. All those things put a load on the vessel structure. And what we don't want to do is exceed the loads to where we get either, you know, worst case structural failure, but other than that, you know, excessive problems with paint and cracking and so forth. Those types of things can, can, can occur. And so you really, when you're doing stuff this big, you really should look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, assemble a team, and figure out if it makes sense. Uh, you can look at the feasibility of it. You know, how, how, how is it going to do? And as I mentioned earlier, we can do anything technically. But if it's going to take 18 months and the guy's trying to buy a used boat so he can have it this summer, then this, it might not be the right solution for him. This was a, a great quote that I read in preparing for this paper as well as a couple from, from last week. Um, and it really shows that, that this, the need to be serious about this, right? So successful refit project, okay, that's great. Um, oh, wrong button again. Sorry, folks. Um, if you need owners, right? You've got to have those, but they have captains, management firms, all taking a part in big, complex refits. Um, boats are complex. The projects themselves are complex. There's a lot of moving parts to keep track of. So you have to have detailed planning, communications, communications plans, management, all of those things in order to successfully complete a refit. And that just goes to show, I threw this up there, I thought they captured it perfectly and what they had written up, I love it. Um, we got to pay attention to this stuff. It's not simple anymore. What's the ultimate goal? I mentioned this a little bit earlier, owner satisfaction. you got to keep the owner happy. If he's not in yachting, we're not going to be in yachting. It's that simple. Uh, how do we do that? First tenant up there, I love. They don't like to be taken, feel like they're taken advantage of. They've all got tons of money. If they have a boat that's over uh, 24 meters, let's just say, they got plenty of money. Um, but they had it by being, and they had it today by being smart. And what you don't want to do is let them think that they're being taken advantage of. They don't have a problem paying, but most of them do, right? Some of them are pretty stingy on the maintenance from time to time, but or can be stingy on the maintenance. But um, if you make them feel and you're transparent with them, this is what it's going to cost. This is what it takes. I don't find that money is often a challenge. Um, make sure the yacht's available to want it. The last six or eight months. The yacht owners, every single one I've spoken to has said very directly, there's nothing more valuable to me than my time. And they're only going to use that boat for one or two weeks out of the year. That boat better be ready. 
If the boat's not ready, they're going to get frustrated with it. Boats are unreliable. My captain, my crew, uh, my yacht management company couldn't even keep my boat running for the one week of the year I wanted to use it. They're going to leave the sport that we call home. Um, and then the last one is make sure the bo modified vessels meet their expectations. Uh, you're going to put a gyro on. Is it properly sized? I'm sure that Nick and the crew at Sea People do a fine job making sure that it's the right size for the boat. But if the owner's expectations are different, that's where a lot of the problems are posed. So we do that through stakeholder management, trying to really talk to them, understand their need, and tell them what they're going to get. Um, but honestly, um, you know, what's another good example of that? Uh, oh, the boat's quiet now. I want to I want to make it go 30 knots instead of 20 knots. Okay, we can put new engines in, but we're going to cram everything in. There's no room for anti-vibration mounts. You've got on sea trials with just 30 knots, but you got to wear your earmuffs, you know, as an extreme example. Um, that would be a case where, where we, let, we let go of one of the key things they were interested in. Um, and there's how to do it. It's a quick bullet list, right? Nothing special there. There's nothing new. You guys all know that. Uh, but it's worth repeating uh, in a step-by-step -step process to get the right team, evaluate the feasibility, does it make sense, uh, understand the true work scope, Assess the financials, right? That's a little cost-to-benefit, make-or-buy decision, right, if we've ever heard that term. Execute it professionally, keep everybody involved, good communication, and maintain the quality and the value of what you've got. You want to make sure whatever your repairs are don't deteriorate or your changes don't deteriorate the value of the vessel. Um, really, where we come in, the naval architect is right here, right? Uh, we, we do project management. We do construction oversight. But, but this is really the key things that we could be of value to you in making or breaking a deal on how it works, whether it's feasible or not. We can help you do that really quickly, as a matter of fact. Love this one. Remember the golden rule, golden rule, right? It's all about the owner. He's got to be satisfied. What this does not mean is that the owner is always right. If the owner is not right frequently because we have more knowledge about boats than he does or she. And what we have to do is tactfully remind them that perhaps there is another way. Yeah, just a fun. Um, so how do we do that as we sit down? I mentioned stakeholder management, and then I just mentioned he's always, uh, it's the golden rule, so he's in charge, but he's not always right. I try to work with this. This is what we call the Iron Triangle, and I can change those points to be anything of any three you know, competing needs in any project. Uh, when I look at naval architecture, uh, I might put speed on one axis up the top or one apex, and I would put horsepower on another one, uh, and then I would put cost on another one. Right? So you can do this, whatever, but this is the typical triple constraints of project management. Again, I imagine you've seen it before. The important thing is in the middle is where we have to play. I have quality written in there. Um, because that's what you get, right? If you end up over here versus over here, things move a little bit. I think the key thing here is to recognize that all three of these things is what's going through an owner's mind with respect to this deal he's about to make, right? He's, he's trying to spend some money. How much is it going to cost? How soon will I get to use my boat? Am I going to be happy with the quality of what I get? Um, and if I go into this refit thing, you know, how extensive do I get it? Do I try to just fit the surveyor list of the defects? Or do I go ahead and change the uh, aft cabin because um, my captain's married and my chief's doing I want him to have a double bed? Uh, so all of those things kind of go into it. Great takeaway from this one that I want to point out. The owner on every single project has a position on this chart. He could be, this is more important to him this time. It could be schedule driven or it could be budget driven. Where the owner or customer is today on the project that you're talking about with him may not be where he was on the last successful project you did with him. So I think it's very, very important to go back and talk to the owners every time to understand, for this project, where are you? That way we're all on the same page. Good communication. Okay, so this is the cheat sheet, and I think I got one more. So, so take a picture of these, um, and, and these are the real questions to ask yourself. If you ask yourself these and you say the answer out loud, you'll know if you need to call me or Murray and Associates down here, or Horizon, or whoever the case is, right? But the idea is we're all here to help you get through this and the owner through this successfully. So how expensive, extensive is the defect list? If it's real long, you might find that, gee, there's probably a risk that as we start opening some of these things up, we're going to discover something that's not on the list. Discovery is very difficult to deal with during refit because it's unexpected. We know as professionals to plan for the unknown unknowns, and that's what a discovery is. But how do you execute it and get it taken care of quickly? So if, if we think we're going to find some, maybe we, maybe we got to, maybe that fact is a new decision. 
Um, are we doing major upgrades that we need a naval architect to identify a technical solution? Are we changing to a diesel electric hybrid propulsion plant? Uh, are, we, are we looking for what type of stabilizer suits this owner's needs, whether it's a gyro or fins or whatever? Um, so really getting somebody involved there. How extensive is the work scope? You know, I've, we all joke about the captain comes in, he throws the work list on the desk, and he drops the keys off to the project manager and says, all right, I'll see you in a month and a half. Um, and then he comes back. Well, that's, that's a work list, and it's not a work scope. There's no specifications. There's no tolerance or agreement on what's good. Is this good enough? I don't know. It's not defined. A naval architect writes specifications and can bring those into the game such that everybody knows what a good outcome is going to be defined as. All right, five-year survey, again, um, you know, are you, if you're getting ready to go in a five-year survey in a year and you've got to come out of the water, maybe you don't want to do a refit right now. Um, maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense. What level of documentation is available? We work on several yachts. The owners have grandiose ideas. There's not a drawing available, and that makes it really, really tough. Not necessarily the geometry, right? We've all got 3D laser scanning services these days. You can scan something. You can understand what the geometry is, but... What are the guts? What are the underlying principles within the, the vessel? How thick is the plating? How corroded is the plating? Um, you know, if we want to modify the electrical system to put in a new gen set, uh, do we have electrical drawings available? I mean, there's miles and miles of wires on a yacht. So that could affect the level of complexity of the refit, which could take more time and more cost, and so therefore we should, do, we should identify that up front. Um, private to commercial yacht, I don't think I need to talk about that. Changing class or flag, that makes sense, right? People, Different people have different rules. And if you're a pleasure yacht and you want to go to commercial, you have more stringent safety requirements. So does it make financial sense? You guys know the value of a boat. The guys in here who are boat yard reps today from RMK and All Points, for example, they can help you very quickly count by 10,000. I love that rule, count by 10,000. So it was shocker the day that my dad told me something about uh, some repairs on my house I had to do. He said, count by thousands. Um, well, boat owners count by 10,000, especially yacht owners. Maybe some of them count even by 100,000. Uh, but you can do that relatively quickly to sit down and count by $10,000 and just say, okay, in order to get through this refit, it's going to be X number of dollars. Probably rough order of magnitude, you know, plus or minus 40%. That might be good enough to make the initial make or buy decision. And then if you decide that, hey, we really can, we should think about this a little more, then you sharpen your pencil and you do a better do a better job quoting it. Um, styling changes. Do they affect stability or machinery systems? If they're going to change something that's on the boat, um, you know, hey, maybe Rich needs to be consulted. You know, he knows about these things. Um, those are the functionality, vessel functionality things uh, that need to be taken into consideration. One is aesthetic, aesthetics. Do I have it up there? No, I don't. But I remember one time this guy wanted to change the, uh, the face board, you know, where they put the illuminated name on the side of the yacht. And when they did that, they changed off and cut the, uh, the machinery ventilation path by 50%. So then the engine started overheating because they changed the board on the superstructure. Uh, they didn't think about those unintended consequences. Um, let's see, center of gravity change. We all know that stability is important, right? Rule number one, naval architecture, keep the bottom wet and the top dry. And, uh, and in doing so, we've got this thing called the center of gravity, and we don't want to move that. So if we're going to be adding loads, changing the weight distribution of the vessel, uh, those are types of things that really ought to have checked from an engineering sense. Um, key owner values or requirements at risk. You know, lots of people, and again, it, it varies by owner, right? But capability, do they want to have 30 knots of cruise speed? Comfort, do they want to have the, the soft riding boat? Uh, quality, does everything need to be fit and finished to an absolute T? Schedule, that's pretty self-explanatory and risk. That's that pain tolerance I mentioned earlier, right? What do they see as a risk? Do they, is the risk form meeting the, uh, the Easter holiday in the Bahamas? Or is the risk, uh, you know, the wallet driven in this particular case? New technologies. Everyone wants the latest and greatest, and then they will be the first to call you up and tell you this brand new thing you put on my boat doesn't work. So if you expect to have the latest and greatest bleeding edge technology installed and used the boat next week in the Bahamas for Easter, Guess what? It might not work. You have to have a little patience. Just take that patience bill my dad used to tell me about all the time. I still haven't found it yet, but he kept mentioning it for years. Um, and then uh, lastly is uh, intrusive or invasive. That's the one that really gets me. How deep do you have to go to make it happen? You guys can answer that yourselves, you know? Uh, a full interior reef that's pretty invasive. Pulling all the wires for a communication system, that's pretty invasive. You have no telling what you'll have to uncover or take down, reinstall, and what you'll uncover in the process. 
So let's talk about a couple little case studies here so we can wrap up. I'm probably, am I doing all right on time, Paul? Okay. Um, so this was a good one. Owner, uh, oops, sorry. Owner wanted this boat, 78-foot cockpit motor yacht. Uh, he wanted to go to uh, Texas. Uh, no, sorry, from Texas to Mexico. It was a long run. Uh, and he, um, as a condition of sale, they were going to repower from the old engines to the new engines because they were supposed to be more economical and the boat was going to go farther. Uh, they put the new engines in, and they tried seven different sets of propellers, and there was a target value the captain was looking for, something like, you know, let's just say 100 gallons an hour at 19 knots. And he could not achieve what the boat did previously. So the boat before was 100 gallons per hour at 19 knots, and he was burning 110 gallons per hour at 19 knots. And the people that sold him on the sale and the refit said that you'd be getting, you know, 90 gallons per hour at 19 knots, so you'll be able to have the range. Well, what we found out was, once they got the naval architect involved, was that whoever sold them the engines and the idea was completely faltered. The new engines had were less fuel efficient than the old engines because of emissions controls and requirements, right? So we had a, an EPA-3 instead of an EPA-1, the fuel consumption, specific fuel consumption, an engine-based parameter that any of the guys here from engine companies can talk to you about. Uh, it, actually, it actually went up on the newer model. Uh, so we had to get involved. We ended up lengthening the hull by putting in a new fuel tank under the swim platform. We did that for two reasons. Number one, it reduced the resistance, so they got some speed. And then they also had uh, better fuel economy, or more fuel for a longer range. So they were eventually able to achieve their goal, but not the first year and not until after another two-month yard period. And more money spent. Um, this client came to us. They wanted a, a styling modernization. Uh, they loved the PJ Sport Yacht Series when it came out. I think that's probably how they find us. We uh, developed the 150 and 135 Sport Yacht back in the day. Um, so they wanted to update this to the Nuvolari Leonard Muscle is what those guys called it. it was a, uh, they did the external styling. And so we proposed the cut line and uh, redevelop it and, and put that shape on there like you want. Budget constraint got it. He said, nope, nope, that's too much. But what I really want is this beach club feel, right? Everyone wants the beach club nowadays. How do you retrofit a beach club? It's a little harder. But uh, the new product that was out at that time was the Opak Mare Transformer. So we said, hey, boss, we can lengthen the swim platform, uh, and we can put this feature in to allow you to have your feet wet. Oh, that's probably good. So we were able to evaluate different ways of, of doing it. Certainly, we didn't do the major styling upgrade, but we did some smaller minor styling modifications to help bring the boat back into the new life. Um, so this was one that was done recently, uh, and the owner wanted to go from the top picture to the bottom picture. Remember I mentioned earlier about uh, center of gravity and stability? Well, uh, they brought us in up front, and we said, yep, that's great. It looks wonderful. I'd love to have that boat myself, but it's not stable. It doesn't meet any stability requirements. And somebody raised their hand and said, well, it's a private yacht, not engaged in trade, U.S. flag, under 300 tons, why does it meet the stability? And the boss raises his hand, he says, because I don't want to flip over. <laughs> so there you go. So what did we do? We had a great opportunity. We sold a gyro to put in the bottom as ballast. We changed out the engines from little, uh, say, C-12s to c 18 so we added 4,000 pounds of engine block in, on, in the boat in order to give them a little more power but a little bit more stability as well. So as the team, we worked together, and we advised you on this up front, never been happier. Absolutely loves the boat. Absolutely loves it. Um, this was one that I would say probably didn't make sense. Um, this was a vessel that was uh, cut in half. Well, not really in half. The back third was cut off, and then we added a huge extension on it. Um, and the boat uh, was eventually finished. Uh, it was a successful project. The owner was happy. The crew that stayed with the boat the entire time uh, did a great, great deal of work on the boat. They turned out to be really positive for our industry. Uh, but it was a, it was a 110-foot Broward. Uh, that was completely gutted, cut in half, down to the absolute shell. The engines were discarded. The in nothing was saved except for the external, and then we added on from that. And the project in the end took an extremely long amount of time, and the boss in this case probably could have bought a boat to meet his needs and had it sooner had he wanted to. So I don't really know. I wasn't that close with the owner. I don't know if he had some sort of nostalgic thing with this boat or if it meant something to him maybe it was this dad yacht you know i just don't know but um this was one that really didn't turn out as smooth and seamless as everybody would like to think that we can typically do and deliver for our owners um it was a pretty pretty significant project if you want to know more about it talk to greg cox he's here i don't see you right now greg but uh, he's in here somewhere
There he is, hiding in the back. Um, so key takeaways, right? Case-by-case -case basis, not all decisions are financial. So there might be pride. There might be a love of a specific boat that they want to have. Um, you know, an old Trumpy, for example. I had a guy, uh, one of, a boat that my dad was driving for this guy. It was a 1913 Matthews. Uh, it's for sale now on the Internet if you want to find it or if you know somebody who wants to buy it, right? It's available. Um, but we actually put a Seakeeper 5 in the back of it because the thing was so narrow and the owner had this fear of stability concern for him. While we all said, gee, you know, we're not sure if the wooden structure from 1912 can take it. We're not sure of these things. But he wanted it. So we did it. He's happy now with the result. Uh, assemble the right team, understand the objectives and the required work scope, right? That's the whole project management thing to get us to the end, right? Um, it may not make sense to perform a refit immediately after a vessel changes hands. Uh, what am I saying there? Well, let's just say you want to change the, the aft compartment or you want to fix all the latent defects that are in the boat that the surveyor identified. Well, you haven't used the boat to understand if there's other things about it you want to change. So in this instance, you might have somebody go in a yard, spend three months right after this transaction, come out of the yard, and then the next thing you know, they're not happy with this, they're not happy with that, they're not happy with this, and they got to go right back into the yard for another three-month period. So my view is that I really think that you should encourage the owner to get at least a little time on the boat. If it's safe to do so, um, after he picks something up to decide really what the scope of his work or his reef is going to be, so that he knows it makes sense for him and the boat in the long run. Uh, the last one is, uh, you know, just, just the kumbaya thing, right? Um, all of us, the actions taken by one of us affect all of us and our reputation. Um, I'm, I'm a hunter and outdoorsman, and I get a lot of that in, in that industry as well. If you see one guy running around brandishing a firearm, that's typically viewed as bad. Um, but you got to use them in the course of hunting, and so you got to do it the right way and, and, and give a good uh, view by the general public. Um, I think that being transparent with the owner, there is the filter, right? You have to make sure some stuff bleeds through, and you've got to keep him informed, but not give him too much information that he's in the boat yard every day trying to help, because when he helps, it takes twice as long. Um, so really, uh, be transparent with the owner. Help him with the business case. Let him understand all the stuff. Uh, there is a boat out there for everyone, and if we can keep them in yachting and keep them satisfied, they will come back. And if you don't get this sale, maybe the next one will. And that goes with me. If I don't get this refit job in engineering package, perhaps uh, you know they'll see value in that and come back to me as a trusted source in the future. Um, so that was pretty much uh, the message that I wanted to deliver today. And uh, if we have some time for questions now, otherwise I'm outside. We do indeed. I'm sure there's some questions from the audience. Mr. Parton has a question. I know it'll be a good one. Hi, it's, my name is Jeff Parton from Lauderdale Marine Center. How many refits do you guys do annually, would you say? Did you see the trend increasing or decreasing? So, so we've taken back a little step from it. We were pretty heavily involved in the South Florida refit industry for a number of years, especially at LMC. We had a, an office there with um, one, of the, one of your uh, tenants. Um, but through the dynamics of the last year, and when we went back and looked at the numbers, what we found was we were spending more money flying up and down the East Coast uh, to get the $5,000 job to the yard. Um, so at that point, we've taken a, a hiatus for a year to try and regroup. So this past year, uh, I've done uh, three refits, uh, and that's it. One uh, 3D scanning for new aft deck furniture, installation of a beam gyro in the back end of a yacht on the west coast, and then um, the last one was um, uh, some, some doors, some sliding doors that had structural problems with. Leading up to this year, uh, when we went back and counted, in the four preceding years, we had touched 120 different yachts. And when I say yacht, I, I mean super yacht or mega yacht, not a giga yacht. I think we're a little too small for that, and there's not a lot of them here. But bigger than a 72 Viking might be. So 120 in three or four years, so that's 30 a year. And, that, and that's not being here, right? I have no idea how many Horizon or, or Murray does, but I guarantee it's an order of magnitude greater than ours. Excellent. Do you have any other questions? John Ivan just told me one day, if there's nothing time the money can't fix, we've got plenty of time. The, uh, you had a couple of questions that you thought would be good ones that maybe the audience might not think of. How do you determine where in the Iron Triangle the owner lies? So, so really that's, um, that comes in with the, the stakeholder management side of things, and, and it's really a good dialogue. You have to sit them down and pin them down. They're all busy, right? We said time is the most valuable thing they have. Um, and so to sit them down and engage with them and, and talk with them about 
what, what your needs are. Are you trying to get to somewhere for a holiday? Uh, do you want the very finest boat? And, and ask it three times. That's the other thing that I've learned in the last few years is you ask somebody once, hey, so, uh, Paul, what do, you, what, what do you want to do with your boat? Go fishing. So, Paul, tell me a little more about that. Oh, I want to catch blue marlin. Well, tell me a little bit more like that. I want to be the next boat that catches 100 blue marlin in one day in Panama in two years' time. Okay, now I've got something as an engineer I can sink my teeth into, right? We can make that happen. So ask it three times and ask pointed questions when you have their undivided attention. Do you have any other questions from the group? Mike, uh, Mark, excuse me. Where's the cutoff length of when you get in, a, a naval architect gets involved? Because we do a lot of repowers that had to do, but we don't get too many times we have to get a naval architect involved. Where's the 80 foot, 100 foot, 200 feet? Because so, I, I deal mostly in 60, 60 and below, and I've never, no offense, never got a naval architect involved. No, that's, that's fine. So that's a great question. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's part of the message here is to say that, you know, we can get involved in anything. We design 25-foot center console boats. Uh, we do naval architecture. We develop the hull form. We do the structure. Uh, we put the engine on it. Uh, we check visibility, right, so compliance. So we, we can do all of that stuff. So when, does a na- when do you really need a naval architect? If there's a problem you're trying to solve, If you're trying to make changes where you're worried about unintended consequences, and then I would say the last one is um, is when you need documentation, right? If you need something for class or the U.S. Coast Guard that says you're safe or your your center of gravity is right, any of those things is is where you would want to get a naval architect involved. And there is no cutoff on length, none whatsoever. I think the real critical thing here is to say, um, is a naval architect going to come in and try to steal a show? And I think the answer to that is no. I think all of us want to be involved to make sure the owner is happy in the end. Um, and I'm more than willing to jump on a plane from Virginia, fly down here, spend a day on the boat with the surveyor and the broker, and just talk to them and understand what it is. And, and you know, and I don't have to get the full refit package or anything like that, but just to share the knowledge of here are the potential pitfalls to look out for, here are the things you ought to consider if you're really going to do that. Um, that type of, of very lightweight interface that's it's relatively – uh, inexpensive in the grand scheme of things can actually provide a lot of protection and risk reduction down the line. Well, that, that's one of my questions also. We can take this off after you're, after you're done, but is there an idea of cost? I mean, just to determine prop size, determine sure. uh, so, staff so, size, so determine all that one. stuff for the repair, because that's all we really need to, you know, we, sometimes we get prop companies to do that. Okay? Right. And, 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 and lots of times, well, not lots of times, but we also um, we we will get engaged for a simple prop selection. If we don't have to travel for the boat and the information's there, it's a grand, right? A new set of wheels these days are 20 grand. Uh, our billing rate for our engineers are 100 bucks an hour. The Toyota mechanic down the street from my office makes more money per hour than my staff of engineers. Uh, so that's just to put it in perspective, right? Um, and, and, and those types of things, you know, a second opinion on a propeller is uh, often quite valuable. Often quite valuable with the amount of different stuff that we have access to in terms of our library. Very, very technical what we do at DLBA, and I know the rest of the guys are also. Um, but propeller manufacturers are working with a product line with limited information, and we can go back to the true science behind it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Excellent presentation.